Brothers and sisters in Christ, today is the second Sunday in Lent, and in today's service, we'll focus on faith in God's promises. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. May you have grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our sermon text today is recorded in Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered according to the flesh? If indeed Abraham had been justified by works, he would have had a reason to boast, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to a person who works, his pay is not counted as a gift, but as something owed. But to the person who does not work, but believes in the God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. Indeed, the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not given to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness that is by faith. To be sure, If people are heirs by the law, faith is empty and the promise is nullified, for law brings wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. For this reason the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's descendants, not only to the one who is a descendant by law, but also to the one who has the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of God, Abraham believed him who makes the dead alive and calls non-existing things so that they exist. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you made us to serve you. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Be with all those who must endure suffering today. Renew us all with the joy of salvation and the sure promise of eternal life through Jesus our Lord. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, everybody needs a good example now and then. If you're working on a craft project, it's good to have an example, a pattern, which shows you what the finished product is supposed to look like. If you're learning a new type of math problem, It's important to have your teacher work through an example or two to help solidify the thinking process in your mind. If you're working on a new machine or making a different product or trying out a new procedure at your place of employment, it's important for someone to make an example or a a sample for you in order to establish a standard which you can follow. Of course, for those of us who are parents and grandparents, We're constantly setting examples for our children and grandchildren. Unfortunately, they're not always the best examples. In our spiritual lives, we have the same need for a good example. And in our text for today, we have such an example. Abraham, the father of many nations, the father of all believers. Abraham serves as an example of godly obedience, an example of faith in God's promises, and an example of righteousness apart from works. Our text begins, What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered according to the flesh? If indeed Abraham had been justified by works, he would have had a reason to boast, but not before God. The matter that's under discussion here for Paul and the Romans is the matter of how a person becomes righteous. And Abraham is brought forward as an illustration, as an example. Abraham was considered by the Jews to be one of the most godly men in the Old Testament. And indeed, throughout the years of of the life of Abraham, he had done a lot of good things, and he could boast of many accomplishments. Abraham had acquired great wealth, and he had shared it generously. He wielded a considerable amount of influence throughout the entire Middle East, politically and even militarily. At one time, he and his 318 servants 
had rescued his nephew Lot from four eastern kings who had already defeated five other kings who were ruling in and around Sodom and Gomorrah. And on the spiritual side of things, Abraham looked pretty good there too. The Lord himself had appeared to Abraham in dreams as well as in person. In Ur of the Chaldeans, God had called Abraham to leave his home and go to a place which he would show to him. Abraham went, even though he stopped before reaching his final destination. And so God called Abraham again in Haran, telling him the same thing. And again, Abraham went. And this time, he actually reached the promised land. But he didn't stay there. Famine drove him into Egypt for a while, and yet ultimately he again returned to the land which God had promised to him. That same God appeared to Abraham on numerous occasions, bringing promises of more land, as well as the prospect of fathering a large family, a family which would carry the seed of the promised Savior. It was in terms of that family where Abraham's obedience met its greatest test. You certainly recall how God began the fulfillment of his promise to Abraham by giving him a son, Isaac. At that time, Abraham was already 100 years old. Yet when God told Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to him, Abraham obeyed, even though the death of Isaac would mean the end of God's promise to provide a savior. Indeed, in terms of godly obedience, Abraham had a lot to boast about before men, but not before God. And that's what Abraham discovered about righteousness through his own experience. Our text continues, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. <clears throat> Abraham's obedience was based on his faith in God completely apart from his works. He believed that God's promises were always true, and therefore he obeyed whatever God asked of him. Now, since that statement could e easily be misunderstood, making our faith sound like a, a good work, which we do to earn God's favor, our text goes on to say, now, to a person who works, his pay is not counted as a gift, but as something owed. But to the person who does not work, but believes in the God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. Let's boil that down to its simplest terms. When people work, their employers ask them to do all kinds of different things. And when they do what their employers ask of them, they receive wages as a well-deserved reward for their labor and effort. Their employers aren't doing them a favor. Their wages are not a gift. They're just paying what they owe by exchanging money for work. That same principle can be applied to our relationship with God. God asks us to do all kinds of different things, but unlike our employers, he requires us to do them perfectly at all times. If we could do that, then God would give us righteousness as an obligation, which he owes to us. However, you and I know it's impossible for us to live lives of perfection. And therefore, God doesn't owe us anything. Yet to the people who put their trust in God, he gives all kinds of things, including the righteousness which is impossible for us to earn. The key words in our text today are these. To the person who does not work, but believes in the God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. God justifies the ungodly. So we as believers need to put all of our good works behind us when we come before God. True faith does not focus on itself, as if to say, I have such a strong faith but there's no doubt in my mind God will save me. Rather, it focuses on God, as if to say, even though I continue to be godless and wicked, nevertheless, God's word tells me that God justifies the ungodly. 
We need to do what Abraham did, simply to openly admit the sinfulness found in our thoughts, words, and actions, and present ourselves to God as the ungodly people we really are. And then we need to trust in God alone, who justifies ungodly people like us. This is reminiscent of Jesus' parable about the workers in the field. Some of those workers were hired at the beginning of the day, and they worked all day long. Others were hired just a couple of hours before quitting time, and only worked for a little while. And yet when the man who had hired them brought around the paychecks, they all received exactly the same amount. Not because they had earned it, but completely out of the employer's generosity. The righteousness we receive comes completely apart from our works. It becomes ours by God's grace, and we receive it through faith. In reality, God's grace is our only chance for receiving righteousness. Fulfilling the demands of the law is totally out of the question. Paul raises an interesting point in that regard. He said, to be sure, if people are heirs by the law, then faith is empty and the promise is nullified, for law brings wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, where there is no law, it cannot be broken. But wherever there is law, there will always be people who break it. And when they do, their actions will arouse the wrath of the one who gave them that law. In this case, God. Salvation is not possible through the law, because we are incapable of meeting its requirements. And besides that, God's gift of salvation was already prepared for us before the creation of the world. So it couldn't possibly depend on anything we do. And therefore, our text concludes, For this reason, the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's descendants, not only the one who is a descendant by law, but also to the one who has the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of God, Abraham believed him who makes the dead alive and calls non-existing things so that they exist. These final words bring together the three important teachings from the Bible, the resurrection of the dead, the creation of the world, and the conversion of the ungodly. All three of them are possible only through the power of God. Only God can put life into a dead body. Only God can call into being things that never existed before. And only God can take a sinner and turn him into a saint. As I said at the beginning of this sermon, everybody needs a good example once in a while. We have a very good example in Abraham, an example of godly obedience, an example of faith in God's promises, and an example of righteousness apart from works. Let's see what we can do about following his example. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, you have forever demonstrated your love for us sinners, because when we were powerless to save ourselves, you had Jesus die in our place. Forgive our sins for the sake of his blood and spare us. With confident joy we praise you, the rock of our salvation. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. O precious Savior, Jesus Christ, you went the way of the cross because of your love for the Father and for us. We ask that you would ease the load of our suffering and sorrow by virtue of the love you have for us and the hope of immortal glory that you have given us. As you were pleased to obey the will of your Father in order to save us from our sins, May we also be filled with a spirit of loving obedience that delights in doing his will. Teach us to know our needs and our shortcomings, that we may always pray to the Father in your name for every needed blessing. 
Teach us to recognize our sins so that we will daily confess them and find forgiveness. Teach us your new commandment that we may learn to love one another as you have loved us. O Holy Spirit, you have been sent into our hearts as Jesus promised. Use our meditation on his sufferings to deepen our understanding of divine love and to increase our appreciation for the sacrifice he made. Direct all Christian pastor, pastors to preach the crucified Savior with unswerving loyalty and bless the hearts of their hearers with faith. Humble the self-righteous, strengthen doubting hearts, and rekindle faith that is growing cold. Redirect the lives of those who have started down the path of sin. Awaken those who are spiritually asleep and restore the blessed truths of the Holy Scriptures to those who have fallen into error. Spirit of God, apply the precious blood of Jesus to all our sins, that we may be perfectly cleansed from them and found acceptable before our Father in heaven. Keep our faith from failing. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.